very warm welcome today to um, Mr. Julie Arbluster. who's going to tell us about the work she's doing on atmospheric modelling. Um, she undertook her Masters at uh, University of Colorado, Boulder, I think. Probably the only, there's probably a few campuses. <laughs> uh, PhD in the University of Melbourne. She was a lead author on Chapter 2 in 2007 of the IPCC report, which makes her a Nobel, uh, a Nobel laureate. <laughs> Um, she's won two prestigious medals, the Anton Hales Medal uh, for the Australian Atmospheric Society. Academy, Australian Academy of Australian Science. Academy of Sciences <laughs> and the Priestley Medal uh, for the Australian Meteorolo Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. She's, if that's not enough, <laughs> she's a CI on the current ARC Centre of Excellence and also um, a CI on one of the few centres of excellence that went forward to the next round. And she's also a CEO on the um, Special Research Initiative for Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. Very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Thanks very much, Perrin, and, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to start with this video of the, um, the winds over the globe. And this is from a, a satellite product um, that really just shows how strong the winds are across the Southern Ocean. Um, and you can see what we call the storm tracks of sort of between 40 south latitude and, and 60 south and, and how much they influence um, the weather over Australia is, is going to be part of the focus of my talk. Okay, so I've titled it The Roaring Forties in a Warming Climate. Um, and yeah, as Perrin said, I'm uh, a chief investigator on the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes and um, this new centre on securing Antarctica's environmental future. Um, I'm also uh, had a long-standing relationship with um, the Catalyst team in the National Centre for Atmospheric Research in, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I'm also on the steering committee for the 2022 um, ozone assessment. So you'll see some ozone kind of assessment plots as I go forward. So just to highlight um, the funding agencies, so um, Australian Research Council and then um, NCAO is funded by the US National Science Foundation and the US Department of Energy. And this is a, uh, lots of students and, and other collaborators have contributed to the research in this talk and I've got a list of the publications at the end. So um, the Roaring Forties is, is um, one thing you can think of is for the, the strength of those westerly winds in the Southern Ocean. Um, there's also the Furious 50s and the Screaming 60s, I think. So they're these really strong band of, of westerly winds, so going from the west to the east, um, that circle Antarctica. Um, and why do we care about them? Um, so I just wanted to start by motivating um, the talk with the current rainfall um, deciles that we had in, in November. So this is from the Bureau of Meteorology. So you can see that um, November, as we know here in Melbourne, was, it was quite wet and um, I think it was a record uh, month, rec record November rainfall, um, and we have records for over 100 years. So, um, and part of the reason we had this uh, wet November was that these um, westerly winds have contracted to the pole in that month, um, and that leads to increased chance of rainfall um, in our spring, late spring summer season over Australia. So you can see that pattern of the, um, on the right is very similar in the, in the east at least um, to, to what we experienced. And you can see on the west coast of Tassie under this poleward contraction of those westerly winds, um, which is also um, uh, defined through the southern annual mode index, which I'll talk about. Um, you also get this drying on the west of Tasmania and that's what was experienced as well. So these rainfall impacts um, are important uh, clearly to agriculture, to water resources um, and understanding how they're going to change in the future is, is really critical. Um, and so you can imagine farmers right now or were cursing a bit in November because they couldn't um, harvest their grain. Um, but hopefully uh, the southern annual mode and this, these westerlies are um, kind of decaying now and, and hopefully the warm weather is here to stay. So it's also, I just wanted to highlight, we've got really warm waters to the north of Australia and so it's this combination of um, what we uh, know as the La Nina, uh, which is a tropical mode of variability and this southern annular mode that's contributing to the current, current um, weather we're experiencing. 
So how do we measure the westerlies over the Southern Ocean? So I, I showed a, a video from satellite of those uh, westerly winds. Um, but that's really only av available, I think, that product from the 1990s. And, and we really want to have longer records uh, to be able to see how these um, winds are changing or have changed in the past and to understand how they'll change in the future. So as I mentioned, one method of um, measuring the westerly winds, the strength and their position of these winds, is to use this Southern Annular Mode Index. So it's, it's when the uh, winds move forward, you get a higher um, belt of pressure here in these mid-latitudes and then lower pressure over Antarctica. So um, people have come up with an index to uh, assess the strength of the winds or relate it to this difference in pressure. Um, so the SAM index, which I'll talk about quite a bit, is this difference in pressure between the mid-latitudes and the, and the polar regions. Um, and you can see uh, this is a quite an old figure now, but it's um, showing trends in these winds um, and, and they have moved forward um, over the uh, recent past um, and, in our, and that's primarily in our summer season uh, and that has uh, led to increased rainfall over, over Australia in the summer. So to get longer records um, of of these westerly winds, uh, Gareth Marshall um, in the British Antarctic Survey came up with a station-based index. So these are all um, stations in Antarctica for the, the polar latitudes and then some islands um, and South America and um, New Zealand and, and Australia uh, to try and get longer records of this uh, Southern Annual Mode Index, which is uh, an indication of the, the westerlies over the Southern Ocean. So you can see that takes us back to the, the 1950s. If we look at all these uh, sea level pressure, pressure data from these island um, stations uh, and create this, this index. And you can see that it's been um, increasing. So consistent with uh, what I showed previously that the, um, as you um, move those storm tracks and those westerly winds forward, you get an increase in this um, SAM index. Um, yeah, so they're basically this, this mid-latitude minus that polar region um, pressure. You can also reconstruct um, this southern annular mode um, from tree rings uh, and pollen records and lake sediments. Um, and many uh, people have, have come up with different uh, reconstructions of the SAM over the last uh, thousand years. Um, and uh, for, there's a lot of uh, variability between the different different reconstructions, uh, but you can see in that last um, 50 to 100 years, it's really uh, gone positive. So this indication that the, the westerly winds have moved towards Antarctica. In looking at the last 100 years, we have uh, better records from, from um, observed stations. Uh, we can try and reconstruct um, through that Marshall Index that I showed, and then also other data sets. And, and again, it suggests that um, the recent increase is unprecedented in at, la in at least the last uh, past three centuries. So as you can see from that very first plot I showed, um, the movement of the, the westerlies can have a really important impact on our climate in Australia. So it's important to know if this is due to climate change or, or is it just you know some random variability that we're experiencing. So another way to measure the westerlies is uh, to use um, reanalysis data. So I just wanted to give a bit of a background onto what reanalysis data is because I'll be showing a little bit of it. Um, and that's where, uh, because the data I've showed so far is just at the surface, but we really want to know how the atmosphere as a whole has changed. So what reanalysis does is it blends the um, observations, so from satellites, from, from planes, from ships, um, from balloon launches, from uh, station data at the surface, um, with weather forecasts, um, weather forecast models, uh, so using modern weather forecast models. So it's assimilating all that data into the weather forecast and then using um, that best guess of the weather forecast to uh, complete our understanding of the atmosphere. So it's been coined um, maps without gaps. And so it's a way that as uh, atmospheric scientists and climate um, scientists, we can get a, a bigger picture of, of what's happening to the, um, the climate 
but it does have some limitations. Um, before the satellite era, there really just isn't enough data, um, particularly over the Southern Hemisphere, to constrain the weather forecast models, so it just becomes um, another model of the, the climate system. So you can just see uh, yeah, the different changes in this is surface temperature um, over that, that time period. That They've used one forecast model and assimilated all those observations into it to constrain it. So if we look at those um, reanalysis products, we can compare them to the true observations, which are these station records um, in the red that I showed um, earlier. And you can see that with, um, again, we can reproduce this um, poleward uh, shift of those westerly winds, which is an increase in the SAM index um, over the, the recent 40 to 50 years. Um, and here is from the reanalysis this position of the jet. So you can find where the, the westerly winds are strongest over the Southern Ocean and, and find that latitude and, and see that that's drifting from yeah, 40, 48, 49 um, down to, to 51 degrees latitude. But you also notice that it's kind of stopped shifting, right, in the last um, few decades. Uh, so what's going on? And this um, is a little bit contentious at the moment. There's some uh, products that suggest that uh, this hasn't paused yet, that the, the westerlies are still moving um, forward. And this is primarily in our austral summer season. Um, but this paper in um, Nature last year suggested that this pause in the southern hemisphere circulation changes, so this shift in the jet forward, um, is due to the Montreal Protocol. So how, how does the Montreal Protocol um, affect our westerly winds over the Southern Ocean. So first, just to explain what the Montreal Protocol is, most of you will know that it's the uh, most successful environmental agreement ever. Um, and it was to uh, control substances that deplete the ozone layer. layer. So uh, the, uh, this is just showing the um, chlorine um, in, the, in the stratosphere and, and that if we um, had kept using uh, ozone depleting substances like chlorofluorocarbons and other refrigerants, um, we would have increased this um, uh, chlorine in the stratosphere and that um, we was discovered led to the destruction of ozone. Um, and so there's been a really successful international um, agreement around um, switching from these ozone depleting substances to, to other refrigerants that don't destroy ozone. Um, and you can see the different, different paths that, that we could have gone. We could have uh, kept going up here um, and led to really massive ozone destruction, uh, depletion, or um, we're heading now down uh, to, to recovery and, and uh, cleaning up that chlorine in the atmosphere. So every four years, there's an as a scientific assessment panel that produces a report that's legislated. So Australia is a party to the Montreal Protocol. Um, I've been involved in the last two um, as an author, the 2014 and 2018, and now I'm on the steering committee for the one that's coming out now. And we have um, uh, Ariane Purick, who's in, um, hosted by Monash here, is, is involved in that, as well as one of our adjunct professors as authors. So um, how does that I guess, interact with the climate. So the Antarctic ozone hole, we th mostly think of as, as um, ozone leading to uh, um, changes in ultraviolet radiation um, and associated with skin cancer. But in the last few decades, it's become clear that in the Southern Hemisphere, the Antarctic ozone hole has impacted our um, climate. Um, so here I'm just showing the ozone hole. Um, from the 1980s uh, in 2006, and then the most recent one. And this is the October ozone, which is when it really peaks. Um, and in here is just measurements of the total ozone over Antarctica from various stations and satellite measurements. And you can see that um, it was really declining through those 80s and 90s, um, getting really strong ozone hole. Um, and then it's plateaued in the last few decades. So, um, I want to highlight that in terms of global temperatures, the ozone hole doesn't have much impact, 
Um, but it does have an impact on our surface climate, particularly in, in the summer. Um, and that's consistent with what we've been seeing in those westerly winds that um, as the ozone recovery is starting, so we're not getting as strong. We still get ozone hole every, every spring, but we're not getting it as, um, uh, we're starting to, to get um, back towards um, the previous values. Um, and it is projected to recover by the mid to late 21st century. So in terms of these shifts in the westerlies, um, ozone depletion uh, cools the stratosphere over the uh, South Pole, and that leads to this um, shift of these westerly wind belts um, towards the pole because it changes the, the temperature gradient between the tropics and the polar regions. Um, it has lots of other impacts on, on climate as well. It's um, suggested that it's helped um, expand these substance regions. Um, and uh, yeah, changes in the rainfall patterns associated with this shift in the, in the westerlies. But greenhouse gases have also led to um, a similar uh, shift in, in those westerly wind belts. So it's a, a question still as to how much is due to ozone depletion and how much is due to greenhouse gases and then what the mix will be going forward. And that's um, a big part of what my research has been on. So I just wanted to show this um, animation. This is by a Melbourne Uni student, Kane Stone, who was part of our previous um, Centre of Excellence. Uh, and he ran the Australian climate model um, with uh, ozone chemistry. Most of our climate models don't include ozone chemistry. Um, and it just shows that uh, when we can incorporate all these processes into a climate model, um, we can simulate uh, things like the ozone hole. So this is just showing the ozone in blue over Antarctica and then you see these uh, purple colours um, are the polar stratospheric clouds which are really important um, in accelerating the destruction of ozone once the sun comes up. So they only form um, when the temperatures over Antarctica are really cold. Uh, and so once the, the sun comes up um, you'll start to see ozone depletion and so you see the blue colours um, disappearing. And then in the spring you get this really, really strong ozone hole. So that's high up in the, in the stratosphere, so 10 to 15 kilometres above the surface. Um, and the impacts of that ozone hole and the changes that leads to in the, the temperatures up there and the winds um, propagates down to the surface in the lower atmosphere in the summer. Um, and impacts our, our climate. Okay. So some early research that I did was to look at um, all the different drivers of these um, changes in, in the winds. And, and in this case, I'm looking at the sea level pressure, which is again that proxy for the, the change in the winds. Um, and so I just wanted to say that uh, when we put all of the different um, uh, things that we know have, have changed over the, the historical um, period, so from uh, the pre-industrial, so 1850 up to present, we know that there's been volcanoes go off that have had an impact on our climate, um, changes in the amount of sun coming in, uh, increases in greenhouse gases, changes in aerosols into the atmosphere, um, ozone depletion, um, and then we put them in our climate models all together as well. You can really see that that um, ozone, if we run our models just with ozone depletion, uh, we can reproduce um, uh, what has happened um, over that um, 1950 to 1999 period. So that real period of ozone depletion that, that had occurred. But you see that also greenhouse gases um, can lead to that um, pattern as well and perhaps a bit weaker in this model, um, but different models give different signatures. Um, so this uh, is just one of the first model studies that showed that um, ozone was really important to the climate. And since then, we've been trying to refine our understanding of, um, of what uh, the impact of ozone depletion on the Southern Hemisphere climate is. So I'll just show this one schematic um, that kind of tries to summarise all of the different impacts that Antarctic ozone depletion can have on the Southern Hemisphere climate. Um, and this comes from the, the uh, most recent ozone assessment. Uh, 
Um, and so it's uh, led in the summer season to this southward shift of, of the westerly winds and the mid latitude rain. Um, it also has important changes in ocean circulation um, and temperature, which I'll not talk about here, but uh, certainly through um, our Centre on Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future, uh, people like Felicity McCormack and Andrew McIntosh are going to be looking at how um, changes in, in uh, the ocean and the atmosphere will be impacting the Antarctic ice sheet um, and, and how um, different drivers like greenhouse gases and ozone depletion might be contributing to that. Okay, so that's when you're thinking about um, human-induced changes on our, our westerly winds. Um, it's clear that greenhouse gases and ozone depletion have played a, an important role, and as the ozone hole recovers, um, that'll, that mix will change going forward. But recent work has really highlighted that natural variability of our climate system um, is also important in understanding the, the trends that we've seen. So um, this uh, study, uh, led by Jerry Meal, who's in um, the National Centre for Atmospheric Research um, in Colorado, who I've collaborated with for a, a really long time, um, was suggesting that, that um, these anomalously strong westerlies that we've seen um, over the last uh, decade or so um, uh, could be due to changes in the tropical Pacific. Um, and so I'm just showing um, one um, indicator of, of these changes on long timescales, so these are decade-long timescales, um, and it's called the interdecadal Pacific Oscillation. Um, and it's just indicating warming or cooling of the tropical Pacific. And so for those of you who um, are familiar with El Nino and La Nina, which is more on this year-to-year -year timescale, this is a decade-to-decade -decade timescale. Uh, and so Ben Henley in, in um, the School of Earth, Atmosphere and Environment has um, created a, a time a way of measuring this, this decadal variability. Uh, and so when we've had um, cooling in the tropical Pacific, which we've had over the last decade, um, it's suggested that that leads to enormously strong westerly wind, wind, winds over the Southern Ocean. Um, so uh, um, PhD student Dawn Yang um, has, has done a really nice study trying to understand this combination of natural variability of the climate system on these decadal timescales. Um, and the external forcings or the human induced um, changes. And so can we separate the influences of those human induced changes from the um, internal variability? Um, so for that, we use what we call pacemaker experiments. Um, you, you don't need to know the details of that, but these are climate model experiments. Um, they're called pacemakers uh, because the first ones were using the tropical Pacific um, where we, we basically um, nudge the temperatures in the tropical Pacific to, to what was observed over the last uh, 50 years or so. Um, and they're called pacemakers because it's understood that the tropical Pacific is kind of the pacemaker of the global climate. So what happens in the tropical Pacific can um, lead to large changes globally, uh, more than the other ocean basins. Um, but we, we can do them in different regions. Uh, we've done Indian Ocean, tropical Pacific, and then North Atlantic just to really understand how that combination of natural variability of the climate system has um, interacted with the human-induced changes due to ozone depletion and greenhouse gas increases. So um, these are looking at the, the changes in the winds, and sorry, this is um, a view probably most many of you aren't familiar with, but this is centred on Antarctica, uh, and this is looking at, at the the changes in the winds. So in the black contours is just the mean westerly winds um, that circle Antarctica. And then the colours are looking at the, the change in those winds. And so in the observations, as we've seen um, between these, the most recent um, period and, and the previous uh, two decades, the winds have shifted towards the pole, as I've been showing. If we run our um, climate models with just all of the human-induced forcings we know about, we do get that shift, but we don't get um, the nuances in the pattern. Um, but if we do run with um, where we nudge our models to the, the tropical Pacific changes that have been observed, then we, we do get the shift combined with um, here in the, the uh, um, South Pacific, we get this strengthening of the, of the winds there rather than a... Um, rather than a shift, which is what's observed. Uh, 
Um, we've also looked at the other ocean basins, um, North Atlantic and Indian Ocean, and they show much weaker changes. So um, Dawn really uh, highlighted that these tropical Pacific SSTs um, are, if you're looking at the, the zonal average around that line of um, the Southern Ocean, uh, they have a comparable influence, um, in this yellow bar, in that jet shift um, as external anthropogenic forcing does. Um, but there's more work to be understood in, in terms of looking at different climate models and, and whether this is a robust result. Okay, so that was thinking about um, poleward shifts in the southern hemisphere westerlies. What about um, equatorward shifts? And so another motivation um, is when we're thinking about uh, previous Novembers, um, November 2019 was quite dry, um, and that was when those westerly winds expanded towards Australia. Um, and that was a decrease, leads to this decreased chance of summer rainfall and, and a negative phase of that southern annular mode. Um, and it's really, uh, just to highlight, that was also um, quite a cool ocean here. So it's this combination again of this tropical and um, polar kind of forcing of, of our climate. Um, but if you look at the December, you really see just how dry it stayed. Um, and we all know um, the impacts that that drying had um, for that, you know, the, the drying from the previous years, from November, uh, from 2017 up to 2019, um, and then leading to, um, or culminating in, in the bushfires that we had that, that summer, the um, black summer fires of late 2019 to 2020. So there's a really nice paper for those who are interested um, in, in looking at um, how climate variability and change um, connects to, to lead to increased risk of, of forest fires um, in Australia, in Southeast Australia. But it's really clear that um, those fires had huge impacts, um, 33 lives lost, lots of hospitalizations, many houses um, and hectares burnt. I think the, the largest ever um, burnt in, in the history of um, Australian fires. Um, and there's also, yeah, in New South Wales, they, they note that there were 293 threatened fauna species and 680 threatened flora species that may have been impacted by the fires. Um, if you look at the, the, um, the climate conditions around that, um, that uh, late spring, uh, summer, it was really hot and dry, um, really unprecedented. Um, leading up to the, the fires. So climate change is, is clearly having a role, but um, at the time we um, just published in October 2019, a study suggesting that, um, uh, that this shift in those uh, westerly winds towards Australia also were contributing or could contribute to hot and dry conditions over Australia in this October to January period. So this was a study led by Umpua Lim at the Bureau of Meteorology, and she's part of our um, Antarctic um, centre as well. Uh, but you can really see, yeah, the impacts um, that these westerly weakenings or um, a weakening of the polar vortex around Antarctica can have on our climate. Um, so this was published and, and it was suggested that um, at the time that this, it just coincidentally, there was a polar vortex weakening happening at the time and uh, the predictions were saying that this would continue um, for the next few months. Um, and so I'll just skip through this because um, it's a bit complicated but it was really clear that the, the southern annular mode index, this um, pole and our equatorward shift of those westerly winds um, was really strongly um, negative um, and, and that was predicted in, in late July uh, that that would stay um, negative and, and increase the fire risk. Um, and then we saw, unfortunately, that eventuate. Um, and, and so UNPA has, has a follow-up study saying that, suggesting that this weakening of the polar vortex or the, which is linked to this um, shift of the westerly winds equatorward, um, really contributed to that um, fire danger index, particularly in that New South Wales and Eastern seaboard location um, compared to, to some of the other drivers going on. Okay. I might just skip. I've, we've also um, done some studies saying that these winds are really in, important in, in changing Antarctic sea ice as well. So I just want to um, um, touch now on what's going to happen in the future. 
So the big question as a climate scientist is, is really uh, how will this internally generated variability of the climate system across lots of different timescales from year to year to decade to de decade um, interact and combine with anthropogenic forcing in the future. So with ozone hole recovery, um, that's going to push the, the westerly winds uh, equatorward, but greenhouse gases are going to keep pushing it um, poleward. And, um, and so greenhouse gases warm the tropics more than the polar latitudes, and so they, they um, increase that gradient between the tropics and the poles and, and shift these westerlies poleward as well. So what does the IPCC report say is going to happen? Um, so for the first time in the IPCC summary for policymaker, they mentioned the impact of um, stratospheric ozone recovery. Um, and so the, the summary line is that the projected southward shift and intensification of um, the mid-latitude storm tracks, these westerly winds, um, is likely uh, to continue in the long term under these high greenhouse gas emission scenarios. But in the near term, um, ozone recovery will, will counteract these changes. Um, and so here is the Southern Annual Mode Index again. Um, so the more positive it is, the, the more poleward those westerlies shift. And you can see for this 2021 to 2040 period, it's um, not really uh, saying anything strongly in the different, different seasons here that we have. So there's a, a bit of an offset between ozone recovery and greenhouse gases. But, um, and, and it's also um, not a strong signal from the greenhouse gases yet. But in the late 21st century, uh, it's clear that um, under high greenhouse gases, we'll, we'll get this poleward shift of the westerlies, um, but uh, potentially um, a weakening in, um, in that summer season. So in terms of giving policymakers information, um, the IPCC has these nice regional fact sheets. Um, this is for, from the Australasian one. Uh, and they, they looked at the changes in rainfall. Here's the mean rainfall over Australia at different levels of global warming. So one and a half degrees, two degrees and four degrees. And really the only thing that we know about future rainfall change in Australia is in this southwest region. Um, and so that's the only really robust signal that we have. Um, and that's um, a drying there in, in that mean. In Southeast Australia, uh, the, the signal is, is much more uncertain um, and um, really model dependent. And so um, part of our job is trying to refine that and understand why that's the case. In terms of extreme rainfall though, it's really the thermodynamic impacts that are important and, uh, and, and there'll be extreme um, increases in extreme rainfall going into the future. So one approach that people are, are starting to uh, take to try and get away from this, um, basically having really no confidence in, in our rainfall projections over land, to trying to give a bit more context to, to what the models are saying about uh, changes in rainfall is, is to come up with um, physically plausible storylines. So this is just a, a paper from um, Julia Mindlin, who's, um, I, I'm not involved in this study, she's um, in Chile. Um, and, and she's looked at various southern hemisphere regions and, and tried to come up with the mechanisms for how the rainfall might change in, in the different seasons. Um, so that tropical warming due to greenhouse gases is, is one mechanism um, that, that leads to changes in, in the southern hemisphere mid-latitude rainfall. And then that polar vortex strength is another one. And so looking at the different combinations of those, uh, we can come up with the storylines for how our rainfall might change. Um, and so for in our summer season, um, the, the, um, the polar vortex size uh, does um, seem to make a bit of a difference. Uh, so the models that have a small polar vortex um, into the future um, will have more rain here in southeast Australia than the ones with a, a large one. Um, and then the tropical warming leads to this increased rainfall in summer. In winter you can see that southwest Western Australian um, drying is in all of the different combinations of these mechanisms um, and, and the polar vortex um, doesn't seem to be as important. So this is um, a new approach that we're um, that 
climate science community is trying to come up with to help decision makers determine risk and, and really understand the mechanisms of regional climate change. Um, and as we refine our understanding of these different mechanisms, um, we'll be able to refine those storylines and, and give better information. Okay, so I'm going to conclude there. Um, so the movement of the Southern Hemisphere westerly winds and the Southern Annual Mode over the Southern Ocean um, are really critical to understanding regional climate change. I hope I've um, demonstrated that for Australia, at least our, our rainfall um, is, is strongly influenced by those westerly winds and the um, frontal systems and low pressure systems that, that um, come up to our region. Um, recent studies have really highlighted their role in, in some record uh, Australian rainfall and, and temperature extremes, um, as well as um, rapid declines in Antarctic sea ice. Um, uh, I skipped over that, but um, we've got a, oh, if you want to look, I've got a conversation article that um, you can, can look up if you're interested in, in, in that study. Um, we do um, have potential for improved seasonal predictions um, using this information that that has um, come out about the importance of the Antarctic polar vortex uh, for driving some of these uh, hot and dry extremes over Australia. Um, if we can improve um, our um, seasonal prediction models uh, that the Bureau of Meteorology uses, for instance, they don't currently incorporate that ozone chemistry that I was showing. And that might be a really important feedback um, in, in terms of um, how the, the um, information from that polar vortex over the stratosphere gets down into the, the surface climate. Um, in terms of future projections, there's uh, indications of an overall shift towards Antarctica um, under these high greenhouse gas emissions. They are offset by stratospheric ozone recovery in, in the summer, um, in the near term, but it's really um, a large spread across the models. We don't really understand the mechanism for how um, greenhouse gases uh, shift these westerly winds forward. So there's lots of work to be done to try and um, constrain those projections and understand how internal climate variability will, will lead um, to changes in that near term. And a lot of work is um, going on in, into decadal predictions of that internal climate variability. Um, and then just at the end, I, I talked very quickly about storylines and how they can be used to provide these physically plausible risk assessments. Um, and it's important to incorporate both human-induced and internal variability of the climate system into those. Um, and finally, just I think in the climate science community, there's a, a real shift now to trying to um, provide regional climate information. Um, we've, uh, since the Paris Agreement was, was signed, we um, have gotten away from having to, to uh, show that humans are really driving um, changes in the climate. And now our focus is on better understanding of that regional climate change, because that's um, what's needed going forward. So to do that, um, we really need to understand these changes in the atmospheric circulation. That's uh, what drives a lot of the difference between the models um, in their projections of regional climate change. Um, Perrin mentioned the, the new Centre of Excellence bid that um, Professor Christian Jacob has um, put up uh, and that's really calling for some improvements in, in the models, both in terms of resolution and physics um, and, and our understanding of this circulation. Um, and that's what's needed to provide useful information for businesses and policy makers at the local scale. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Julie, for that uh, fascinating talk. Um, raised, certainly raised some interesting questions in my mind. Uh, I'm sure the audience has got questions, so maybe we'll throw it over to the audience first that's, that's here, um, and then if there's any questions over Zoom, I'll um, invite people to unmute themselves. And talked about the reanalysis of uh, raw data, and you mentioned that in the Southern Ocean, you have you know, not that much data, so that mm -hmm. you know, to some extent there's a climate model. How do you assess somehow the uncertainties in it when you have this kind of data pool model, if you like? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, the, the one I was showing was um, from the European Centre, um, which is arguably the best weather forecast model in the world. Um, but yeah, prior to the satellite 
era, which is the late 70s, we just don't use these reanalyses. So there's just not enough information going into them um, to, to trust them. Even after the satellite era, I guess there's yeah, definitely still some, some um, difficulties in, in looking at the, um, how the different satellite products, you know, when new satellites come in, that leads to discontinuities. Um, and so uh, there's different reanalysis from different modelling groups around the world, different weather forecasting centres. And so one way to, to look at um, the uncertainty is to compare those different ones. So there's about five that we usually compare and every reviewer of paper um, says I want you to compare it in another one. <laughs> so yeah, but there's still um, some difficulties and in some ways though the um, yeah, the, some of the, the satellite products, um, particularly for rainfall in the southern hemisphere, um, in the southern ocean, uh, have yeah, more discontinuities than these modelling systems, which do constrain, they're, they're constrained by those observations going in. And so they're in some ways more self-consistent. Lincoln. Hey, Lincoln. Um, you said that the, maybe the main effect of ozone depletion on the climate is from the cooling of the, trop of the stratospheric um, yeah. uh, air mass over the Antarctic. Do yeah. I understand this just as, as there's less ozone there, so it's not being focalised, and so less energy is being dumped into the, into the stratosphere? Is that, is that what's happening? Yeah, so ozone absorbs ultraviolet radiation. So yep. it's just the non absorbed it's not there to absorb, and therefore there. Yep. And then, so the extra UV that makes it through and then hits the high albedo surface, is that then mostly then reflected back into space or converted into, into heat and radiation at long wavelengths, or what's the, what's the fate of that additional? Um, yeah, so yeah, as I mentioned, it's not, um, it's not really critical, that extra UV to global temperatures, but over Antarctica there have been some studies. Um, so Sharon Robinson, who's part of our Antarctic Centre, she's at University of Wollongong, has looked at um, Antarctic moss and, and has a record of UV from, from that. So there are some impacts, but I think you're right that most of it just gets reflected back from memory of one study and it doesn't have a big effect, um, even locally, yeah. But there are definitely high UV days down there, <laughs> I think, yeah. But it doesn't, yeah, tend to affect the temperatures too much. I had a question. Um, so 2019 was obviously quite extreme, but if I understood, you know, and, and that's what sort of hit everyone for six in terms of uh, you know, waking up to climate change more or the, 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 the consciousness of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but effectively, if I understood correctly, that increased greenhouse gas emissions are actually going to reduce the likelihood of the westerlies being so far north because, because the consequences of, it, of, of that is, is um, a, uh, an, increasing, an increasing sand which is pushing the, the westerlies poleward. Is that... How has that sort of resolved in, in the climate <laughs> people's minds, is that? Yeah, so um, I think in this paper we, we talk about the um, likelihood of, of weakenings of, of the polar vortex or this um, yeah, movement of the westerlies towards, the, towards Australia going forward. And, and there have been some more recent studies trying to look at, at that going into the future. And it just seems like it was a really rare natural variability event. Just a freak event. Yep. Um, and it, the last one happened in 2002. We've only had that one in, in the satellite era. Um, I think I have it here. I think I skipped over it pretty quick. Um, and this, this so a, a, a sudden stratospheric warming, which they happen in the Northern Hemisphere all the time. You might have seen them in the news. Um, so it's when the, the, those westerly winds reverse and become easterly. Um, and we've only had that one in 2002 observed. This one um, didn't get to um, it didn't get to a, a reversal of the vortex, um, but it, it was a really strong weakening, the strongest weakening that we've seen. And um, but yeah, I guess if ozone recovery is is really a big driver going forward, then we might expect more of these um, sort of negative SAM and, and 
um, movement of those winds into um, north, but um, most of the modelling studies say that that's not going to happen. Yeah. So I suppose background warming with those freak events does that I suppose that amplifies the effect. Is that? Do you have any thought, thoughts on that? So, so you know, this is obviously right. a freak event. Yeah. But the fact that you know, if if, if Australia or, or the world was say one and a half degrees warmer, I presume it would amplify the, the negative effect of that in terms of fire weather and things like that. Obviously. Yeah, and that's the important thing I think that we need to understand is how these rare events, you know, might be getting um, um, influenced by climate change. And so the also going on in in 2019 was this. Um, really cool oceans to the north of Australia in this Indian Ocean Dipole, right? And um, and they are um, projected to get more intense into the future. So it's this, how does climate change just affect the background warming, but also the variability? How will that change um, and combine um, to, to create these really high risk, high impact events? Yeah. Please join me again in thanking Julie for that excellent talk. Thank you.